Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jandia Zubrisky, and I'm director of the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. And today we're pleased to um, co-host uh, the Center for European Studies and CREES, the Center for East European and Russian Studies, a talk by Professor Julia Sonnevent, who's assistant professor here at the University of Michigan um, in the Department of, of Communication Studies. She's originally from Hungary. Uh, she came to the U.S. Um, for her master's in law at Yale and then stayed on uh, to do a PhD at Columbia University and then went on to have uh, fellowships around the world, very prestigious ones in Israel, in Germany, and back in the U.S., uh, and then came to Ann Arbor, where we're very happy to have her with us here. Um, her interdisciplinary research examines the role of media events, rituals, performances, and icons in global culture. And actually, her latest book, which I have here, Stories Without Borders, The Berlin Wall, and the Making of a Global Iconic Event, is a book about these broader issues about uh, public media and global icons. Um, she'll be giving a talk about this, but she also has another book. So 2016 was very... Uh, Productive. She has another book that's called a co-edited book that's called Education and Social Media Toward a Digital Future, which was published by MIT this year, while the monograph uh, was published by Oxford University <coughs> Press. Um, so today she's talking specifically, giving a book talk, basically the fall of the burden wall, the making of a global iconic event. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sonnevin. Thank you, Genevieve, and it's a particular pleasure to be here today and to present the book to the University of Michigan community, and I'm really happy to see some of my students in the audience, too. That's always a real joy. Um, and I chair Nojan Kwak uh, from Communication Studies. So today is a presentation of my book, uh, Stories Without Borders, The Berlin Wall and the Making of a Global Iconic Event. And in this book, I'm raising the question how we can tell the story of an event in a way that people would remember it internationally and over time. Why is that the case that certain events become global mythologies while other events just simply fade into oblivion? That's the central question I'm trying to understand in this book by looking at the case of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And you might ask the question, how did I get this idea to write this book? And it all started with a visit to Berlin I took my five-year-old niece to Legoland. You might, you know, might know this establishment, <laughs> all built from Lego. And as we were walking around with her in Legoland, we suddenly saw a long line of people. And I honestly couldn't imagine why would anybody stand in line for anything in Legoland. And as we got closer, we just realized that it was actually a mini small replica of the fall of the Berlin Wall. So it was a mini replica of this major 20th century European and international event. There was one single wall built out of Lego, of course, little figures, hammers in hand, trying to demolish this one wall. And when you push the button, which my niece, of course, pushed hundreds of times, as you can imagine, this one single wall that has divided the nation for more than 28 years just simply fell like that. So let me show that to you. particularly like the feature that it goes back, you know, <laughs> at the end. <laughs> so, you know, one way to look at this scene is to say this is simply a toy, nothing else than a banal form of commemoration that we shouldn't take seriously. But I believe something really serious is going on here. Namely, this is how this event is remembered internationally as this split-second magical event out of nowhere, a wall that just simply fell. 
So that's kind of the question to me. How is that possible that we had a confusing, contradictory political transition going on in East Germany at that time? But this is how it is, remember, internationally. This is how it functions as a global myth. So I was thinking of this question. I build up a new concept of global iconic events. Um, defined as news events that the international media cover extensively and remember ritually. And what I was trying to do with this new concept is to think through how do we build up global iconic events internationally. And these are narrative dimensions of how we construct global iconic events. Foundation refers to the knowledge we already have about the event. So for instance, knowing about the Twin Towers and the history of New York may help you understand 9-11 as an event. So that's one element in narration that you have some kind of foundational knowledge already. Mythologization is the development of the event's resonant message and elevated language. So if you think about global iconic events like the atomic bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima or, or the Holocaust for that matter, they tend to be connected to an internationally resonant message, be it freedom, hope, trauma, loss, something that people can relate to le relatively regardless of where they come from. Condensation is a classical act of branding. When you summarize the event in a simple phrase, a short narrative and a recognizable visual scene, why do we do that? Because this is how we can quickly recall the event and use it in connection with contemporary happenings. Uh, maybe because I'm originally from Hungary, I'm very interested in this question of clashing narratives in the international context. So I have also looked at how events are differently interpreted in the international context. Some counter narratives even questioning whether the event took place or whether it took place in that form. And then finally, remediation is when the event starts to travel internationally and finds new forms. Um, so the case that I looked at was the fall of the Berlin Wall in four national contexts. Soviet, East German, West German, and American media, right at the beginning of the coverage, uh, in the first six weeks of coverage, and then also anniversaries, first, tens, uh, 20th, 25th anniversary. And I understood media in the broadest possible sense, not only including newspapers and television, but over time also exhibitions, performances, social media. And think about the main questions throughout what I try to understand. How, do we can, how can we tell the story of an event in a way that people would remember it internationally and over time? So in some ways, the main element of the book is to look at the narration of events over time across media and in environments where people disagree about them and have different opinions about them. So if you think about the fall of the Berlin Wall in that sense, <coughs> The fall of the Berlin Wall's narration has many con contradictions. So the first element is that the fall of the Berlin Wall wasn't the biggest protest going on in East Germany at that time. Many people <laughs> agree here who study um, <laughs> German history. So the biggest protest was actually taking place in Leipzig. If you think about the fall of the Berlin Wall in a very strict political scientific sense, nothing really happened on that day. It wasn't the end of East Germany. It wasn't the end of the Cold War. It wasn't certainly the end of the Soviet Union, but everything happened on that day symbolically. So that's the interesting question that nothing strictly political, scientifically, but everything symbolically. How is that possible? Now the second main contradiction of narrating the fall of the Berlin Wall is that the Berlin Wall was not one single wall, as you saw, of course, in Legoland. It was two walls. There was a wide death strip between them. There were hundreds of watchtowers, thousands of border guards. There were spiky objects, dog runs, and so on. So it was an incredibly complicated, very complex border control regime. Nonetheless, there is this in international imagination of a single wall that would come down on a magical day. So that's something that the narration had to, in general, overcome this fact. So how did that happen, that this one, one single wall image emerged while the reality was something like this? In 1978, Jimmy Carter look, looking at this absolute horror of the death strip itself. And we had this imagination of the graffiti filled one wall. So I looked at the narration of the event in East German and West German media. And there was something very interesting that I found. So this is the central icon in the East German press of the Berlin Wall. It was narrated as the anti-fascist protection rampart. Fascism understood in the broadest possible sense, trying to keep out both Nazis, but also financial capital, pornography, so the 
broad understanding uh, of, of what um, fascism entails. And what you see here is members of the combat groups of the working class defending this wall with their very own bodies. Behind them is the Brandenburgade, the central symbol uh, of Berlin, of course. So what you see here is individuals protecting this wall, but it's equally important what you do not see. Namely, you do not see the actual border control regime with all its uh, complexities and horrors. Now, what about the Western narration? This was Willy Brandt's term, Wall of Shame. This is one of the most famous iconic photographs of the Berlin Wall in the Western context. It is 1962. Peter Fechter was 18 years old at that time. He tried to cross from the east to the west. Um, he got shot on the death strip. He cried for help for an entire hour, and neither the west nor the east helped, and he died there on the death strip and got carried away. It's an incredibly powerful icon if you think about it and look at it. it you know, it has a huge art historical uh, meaning too, if you think about the composition and so on. But note again that uh, what you do not see on the image is the actual border control regime. You do not see the death strip. So in both cases, the focus is on individuals. In one case, protecting the wall. In the other case, trying to overcome the wall, but not showing what is actually going on on the ground. So in some ways, the Berlin Wall story got removed from how it actually looked like on the ground. And something very similar happened to the story of the fall of the Berlin Wall as well. So if I mention to you fall of the Berlin Wall, you probably think of images like this one, right? So people from East and West and internationals somehow coming together in this unique moment of hope and freedom, celebrating together opening bottles of champagne and so on. But in reality, and that's you know, maybe surprising to some of you, the fall of the Berlin Wall looked like this. You know, it was an incredibly boring press conference. <laughs> and those of you who sat through boring meetings, which we do a lot you know, in academia too, um, will sympathize with the journalists who fell asleep during this um, press conference. Some of them actually left early and so on. So what happened at that press conference? So East Germany had been working on a new travel regulation for three weeks beforehand. And they decided to announce this new travel regulation at this press conference, along with other new announcements. Um, now, there are two important elements of this travel regulation that you need to know, because they can help you understand the whole narration of the fall of the Berlin Wall. So one is that you needed passports and visas um, to cross the border. Why? Is, was that important? Because most East Germans did not have them at that time, so it would have meant a long application process in bureaucratic labyrinths and not a quick split-second event. So it's a multiple-week application process. But the other, in some ways, even more important element was that the new travel law would not have come into effect on this day, on November 9, 1989, but only a day later, November 10, 1989. Why? Because this way, the Secret Service, the border guards, and so on can prepare for the gradual crossing of the border, not the storming of the border, but sort of gradual step by step. Now, this all sounds neat, except that the person who was asked to announce this travel regulation did not attend the meetings. Um, so it, it, we would probably say it now, he didn't get the memo. But he certainly wasn't there. Um, he claimed to be with journalists, and then he claimed to be with workers. And it's very hard to prove what he was doing. And there are rumors he might have spent the day with his lover uh, from the Central Committee. <laughs> Not something I can write in the book. It's recorded. So I'm saying it with that kind of assumption that it may or may not be true. Um, the most important is he wasn't there, and he didn't know these details. So he went into this press conference without even reading the travel regulation at all. You might wonder, how is that possible? Well, the East German regime was not used to the international press conference format, so he wasn't as afraid of it as it as he should have been. They had one press conference, international press conference, the day before, which went well. So he was proud of that and confident. So he went into this press conference, and you can imagine what the two questions were that he got from the international press. Do you need 
a passport and visa to cross the border. And he was thinking a bit, he was confused, and then he said, I cannot answer this question at this moment, which is already unbelievable if you think about the significance in that context. And then the second, even more important question, sort of the final blow was, what is the day of effect of the regulation? And he looks at this document, he searches, searches, and he picks up two words, immediately, without delay. And those were there, you know, so he actually found them in the document, but they were not about the day of effect <laughs> at all. And this is how the fall of the Berlin Wall actually really happened. It was an incredibly big confusion. Right after this confused moment, the press conference actually ended. And all around it was a colossal misunderstanding, as American historian Robert Darnton called it, but somehow this is not the way how we remember it. So that's in itself interesting, but we might want to think how did we build up then the story of the fall of the Berlin Wall. So one solution would have been from the media after this press conference to say, well, this was confusing. We had no idea what was going on. Clearly, he got confused. And we will get back to you later with more details. We'll figure out and so on. Now, this is not what has happened back then what happened back then. And this was not yet the age of social media, but within three minutes, international news agencies put out an interpretation. Any East German citizen is entitled to leave the country via all border crossing points. See, so it's legalistic, it's confusing, uh, but it certainly doesn't mention anything about the confusion or accident or potential um, lack of clarity when it comes to the meaning of the event. But the real push came two minutes later by AP, East Germany opens borders. So think about the language here. It's simplified, clarified, universalized. It lacks the confusion, the accidental elements, the contradictions. What it has is a message that people, and people can relate to, people can understand very clearly. It's, it's a very powerful, strong summary of the event. And then half an hour later, the West German news agency turned something that was still a possibility half an hour before into existing reality. So the East German border to West Germany and West Berlin is open. Note the difference. It's not only opening borders sometimes generally, it is right now open. It's a massive interpretational difference. Um, and it was out there just 40 minutes after the press conference. And this is my favorite example when it comes to the media narration of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, he is uh, Hans Joachim Friedrichs uh, with a beautiful voice, one of the most famous TV anchors in West Germany, something of a Walter Cronkite. So imagine that type of voice announcing that the gates of the wall are wide open in the most watched West German evening news. This evening news was watched both by uh, West Germans and East Germans at that time. Um, so you might raise the question, was there any gate open at that time when he said this? But there was not a single gate open. There was no border crossing, nothing happening at the border at the moment when he is announcing this. So it's easy to say it's media distortion, but another way of saying is that he pictures something that came later. If you like Austin's theories, it's sort of a performative utterance. You announce something that becomes reality afterwards, or it's a self-fulfilling prophecy for that matter. It certainly wasn't an objective representation of what was going on at the border. Another famous example of the narration is, this is Robin Lautenbach, also West German television news of that night. So he announces the Berlin Wall is merely a monument in front of the Brandenburg Gate, which was the most guarded border crossing point at that time. All elements of the border control regime were intact. All the border guards were there. Nobody crossed the border at this time. And he stands in front of this much guarded border crossing point and says the Berlin Wall is merely a monument. So it's again a symbolic and a mythologized language in contrast to what was actually going on on the ground. Now he was in a hard position because at that time you couldn't move, qu move quickly. It was a very different technological environment. So it wasn't possible for him to move to a more appropriate location. So it was a major contradiction between the image 
and the words and in some ways in this case the words were speaking louder than the images uh, s convincing people st uh, in a stronger way than the actual image which showed across the border so what did the Americans do when it comes to media coverage uh, on that day and some of you might even remember it uh, were in the room so NBC's coverage was the most famous coverage of that day um, because they arrived three days before the fall of the Berlin Wall to the city and that meant actually everything in terms of uh, advantage in media coverage. Tom Brokaff has also had one, also one more major advantage. He had a prearranged interview with this confused party official, Günther Schabowski, who accidentally announced the fall of the Berlin Wall. So they met after the press conference, and, and I actually really recommend that you watch it sometimes, the, the interview. If you like Monty Python or any kind of you know, <laughs> comedy, it's, it's exactly that. So they sit live TV, they have the regulation in hand, they read it together and try to find out what the meaning of the regulation was. And if you can imagine, I mean, the, the magnitude of that moment. And they together realized the mistakes that he made a few <laughs> minutes later. You know, they realized the day of the fact, they realized the passport, the visa, and so on. And so Tom Brokaw actually accurately announced it to the American audience that nothing will happen today, everything will happen tomorrow, they will need passports and visas, but it's a major moment in history. But guess what? People did not watch the American TV uh, <laughs> on the ground. And in some ways, maybe if you look back, that was good. Um, they watched that mythologized, strong uh, West German narration of the event. And over time, of course, uh, Tom Brokaw um, also started to enjoy what was going on on the ground in Berlin. And he also used very powerful symbols in his uh, narration of the event. But note that at the beginning, it was objective and, and factual what he was presenting. So this is the timeline of the uh, press conference and um, the opening of the first border crossing point. So what happens at 11.30 p.m.? So many people gather at the border crossing points right at the Berlin Wall that uh, one border guard, one of the border crossing points, starts to fear for his life. He calls the leadership. He can get a clear answer. More and more people come to the uh, border crossing point, and he decides to open it up. And then people flock to the west. And to mention a personal story, so. He opened uh, the gate, people really storming to the west, and he went back to his office and started to cry because everything he believed in just collapsed in front of his eyes. And then after his border crossing point, one after the other fell, and then the fall of the Berlin Wall happened really in a way, as you remember it, with all the images of the Brandenburg Gate and so on. So if you look at the timeline, what is interesting is that there are four and a half hours between the press conference and the opening of the first border crossing point. Um, many of you, most of you, have been to Berlin. So you know that you do not need four and a half hours to get to the border if you know what the event means. So what people needed during those hours was interpretation. So the dominant theory about the fall of the Berlin Wall is that what mattered were those journalistic questions at the press conference that got the answer out of Günther Schabowski. What I'm arguing in this book, that what mattered was interpretation. Over four and a half hours trying to convince people to make the event happen, to go to the border, to test it out, to try to cross it. Obviously not everybody listened only to television and radio <coughs> coverage. People called each other, met in pubs, and so on. But media played a crucial role in the unfolding of the event on that night. So what did these Germans do when it comes to telling the story on that night? So I researched the East German and the Soviet coverage as well, both at the beginning and over time. And what I have found was really interesting because we tend to praise in uh, Western media the way I use of factual and objective coverage. And this is exactly what was going on in these German media uh, on that night. So they spoke about passports, visas, all the factual details, the confusion, and so on. Um, but it was nowhere close to as exciting as the mythologized, elevated language of the West German media of that night. Uh, and over time, in the coming weeks, what they also did was downplaying the event. They published the event on second and third pages of newspapers, short articles. It was presented as new travel regulation, 
the name of the fall of the Berlin Wall, of course not. It was it presented as a planned event. Uh, they described the ongoing political transition, which was true. They described the three weeks they have been working on the, the travel regulation, which was true. Um, and in, when it comes to images, they didn't show any of the iconic photographs that you know. They showed party officials shaking hands if they showed anything of, of, of the event. So it's interesting to see the counter narration in that sense. And what I'm also showing in the book that then the event with breathtaking speed within three short days got condensed into a simple phrase, a short narrative and the recognizable visual scene. Most of the storytellers, the journalists who told this story of this simple story of the fall of the Berlin Wall were the exact same ones who were there at the press conference. So these are not journalists who didn't understand what was going on on the previous day. Um, you can't say that they just didn't know that there was confusion and accidental elements and misunderstanding. Uh, they ended up narrating this event within three days in this elevated language, and that's what interests me. Um, again, it's easy to say it's media distortion, but I think it was something more like journalists um, try to live through an event that is larger than life and present it in such a way. But what they did at the same time, they edited out all the actors. The, the, the role of the media the previous day was not part of the narration. People just suddenly appeared at the border right after the press conference. So their own role was edited out, which I find really interesting. And also all the elements that they, you know, we might consider boring or confusing, like the ongoing political transition or uh, the accidental elements of the announcements, those were edited out. And even more interesting is the central icon, uh, which was the image of the Brandenburg Gate. Now, this is the central icon of the fall of the Berlin Wall, but this is the only border crossing point, as you know, that remained closed for additional six weeks. So it was really closed for a long time. So you have a central icon that is a closed border crossing point at the moment which was tricky. So journalists decided this is really a problem with the central symbol. So they, they ended up camping right at the Brandenburg Gate for six weeks and pushing for its opening. And after six weeks, it was finally opened. There was an official funeral of the Berlin Wall co-organized by East and West. But this is not the event that we remember. <coughs> the event is the accidental, the magical fall of the Berlin Wall. So that's also interesting. It's not the, the planned event. So how do we remember the event today? I have researched the anniversaries throughout and would like to show a few highlights to you. So this is a 2009 project called the Berlin Twitter Wall. It's by a German nonprofit organization, which is basically a hashtag uh, with the following request. Share your thoughts on the fall of the Berlin Wall now or let us know which walls still have to come down to make our world a better place. So think about the language. It doesn't ask you to remember this major event from the 20th century, this major German event. It asks you to use this event in connection with contemporary happenings. And to the biggest surprise of the organizers, 40% of the tweets came from China. And um, they were in Mandarin, and they asked for the Great Firewall of China. Yeah, so it, it, what happened here that um, the organizers thought people would use this story of the fall of the Berlin Wall in connection with actual separation wars, like the one between the United States and Mexico. Uh, but instead, what mostly happened that uh, people pushed it further out, and they also spoke about virtual wars and social wars, cultural wars, and so on. So this is one example of how the story of the fall of the Berlin Wall travels today. The another form is reenactment. So this, one of the main problems with commemorating the fall of the Berlin Wall is that there is barely anything left uh, of the Berlin Wall itself. So after the magical night of November 9, 19, 1989, in two years, most of the Berlin Wall got completely demolished. There was great desire to you know, erase each and every element of it. And after two or, or even more, more like three years, uh, Germany realized that that's a problem. And why is that the problem? Because then we can't tell the story of the fall of the Berlin Wall if we don't have a Berlin Wall. And this is an ongoing problem when it comes to <laughs> commemorating the event. So they started to preserve the remaining parts. And there are also projects to rebuild the Berlin Wall. So this is an example from, uh, as sounds strange, I know, but it, <laughs> it happens. 
quite often now internationally. So this is an example from Los Angeles, where a little museum, the Vende Museum, transported 10 original segments of the Berlin Wall to LA. Uh, five in original condition, and five got painted by American artists. And you can go there and touch it and, and feel the Berlin Wall. But they did even more. They built a fake Berlin Wall. <laughs> it sounds really odd, but it happened in, in sunny Los Angeles. They blocked a busy avenue for a night. And, um, and then they tore it down. November 9, 2009, and you know, I couldn't imagine, I like, couldn't believe when uh, the, the museum director was telling me that people were actually running away with the fake pieces of the Berlin Wall and, <laughs> and keep it at home. So we have not only the original pieces of the Berlin Wall, but these fake uh, elements that people feel connection to. Now, Berlin itself also rebuilt the Berlin Wall multiple times. This is 2009 on the left um, from Domino's. So these are fake pieces of the Berlin Wall that were sent out <coughs> internationally to school children, to church communities, to international politicians, artists, and so on. They decorated segments of this fake Berlin Wall. And then um, all these segments came back to Berlin. They were torn down on November 9, 2009 and then again sent back to distinct parts of the world. So you have both the original segments and these fake segments internationally signifying the Berlin Wall. The other image is from 2014, the most recent major anniversary, 25th anniversary, when Berlin rebuilt the Berlin Wall out of light. So these are helium-filled balloons, and you can actually walk the original path of the Berlin Wall and kind of feel where it was and how it divided the city. And then these balloons were released into the air, signifying liberation. Um, so in both of these cases, the odd thing is happening that people actually rebuild the wall in order to remember the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then we also have actual segments of the Berlin Wall. This example is from the Reagan Presidential Library from California. But you also see segments of the Berlin Wall in uh, shopping malls for instance, oddly enough, but also um, in, on streets, private gardens, European Union buildings. They are uh, all around the world. East Germany sold quite a lot of them. It was also a major business. Uh, and this tradition of erecting original pieces of the Berlin Wall, segments of the Berlin Wall, uh, is ongoing today. What it signals to me that there is this desire to touch the event. So people want to connect it by actually uh, touching, having a physical connection. It's kind of a corporeal connection to uh, a major 20th century event. And then we also see traditional memorialization. Um, so when I interviewed the Berlin Wall Memorials director, he was telling me that more than 60% of those who visit the Berlin Wall Memorial are under the age of 25. Um, they are the, my students who are here today. <laughs> you know, who were born after the Berlin Wall fell. So the central challenge for him and many others who try to tell the story of the fall of the Berlin Wall, that we have new generations who have no connection whatsoever to this event, who don't know the context of it, and for whom the only way to relate to this event if it becomes a condensed, simplified myth in some ways. So what he did here was, um, he reconstructed the original death strip. Everything that you see here is reconstructed. Not a single segment of the original death strip remained intact. And the watchtower that you see on the left, that was actually purchased on eBay, because mm -hmm. <laughs> there needed to be one. So um, that's something that I find really interesting and, and fascinating cons to consider, that there is young generation of people coming to Berlin, landing in Berlin on Friday, uh, and wanting to see the Berlin Wall dead or all alive in some form on Saturday. And all these organizations have to show some form of Berlin Wall and fall of the Berlin Wall to them. Another way how we recall the Berlin Wall is in these courses of contemporary separation wars. So to mention a few numbers, there are more separation wars now than there were in 1989. So if you think about the fall of the Berlin Wall as a central mythology, to prevent us from building new walls, that doesn't work. But it does work uh, as a major reference point. So what we see here, that there were separation wars pretty much continuously. Then we have much more after 9-11. Uh, 
And then we have even more now in 2015 and 16. Only in 2015, 15 new walls were built. I mean, think about that number, and 40 new walls since 1989. So it is a major international trend that makes us rethink globalization as a process in meaningful ways. I, and I'm arguing in this book that it seems like wars are equally important uh, as bridges when it comes to globalization. And it became a major slogan in the U.S. election as well um, with the war between the United States and Mexico. And what I found by researching contemporary separation wars that there used to be uh, a trend that if you build a wall yourself as a country, you call it a fence. Because that's a technical term, it's kind of a border, um, it, it, it has a function, it's not a symbol. But if you oppose it, you call it a wall. This was very clear in the Israeli discourse that I also researched when I was there, calling it a fence if you build it, calling it a wall when you oppose it. That tradition it was not the case in the American election campaign, where it was called a wall, where it was called a symbol throughout. Uh, so that's a major difference from previous trends when it comes to the narration of separation wars. So this is the first sentence of the book, there was no Berlin Wall and it never fell. And this is not a postmodern take on uh, you know, the history and questioning the facts of it. Well, what I'm saying here that there was not a single Berlin Wall that came down on a magical day. Uh, there was a complex border control regime and there was a confusing contradictory political transition. But somehow this is how we remember it today. It works as a major international myth and most important story about openness, one of our most uh, significant hopeful stories from the 20th century. And whether it survives or not as a major story depends on narration as well. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That was both well documented. Bringing the that was both well documented and humorous, and it brought back lots of memories and reminded me that I'm not so young if I remember <laughs> being there. Um, and I think there are three things that you you talk about that remind me of what it was like that I forgot about. One was um, the for the first few weeks or months being there, there was very little talk of reunification. And I think part of the revisionist history is that as soon as the wall came down, it was there and it wasn't really, if I, don't rem if I remember correctly, until the currency reform that people realized one currency, one, but, it, but there was no talk about unification that I heard in the week or two after. The second thing, I love your talk about the Brandenburg Gate, was because for the mental maps of people in East and West Berlin up until then, the Berlin or the Brandenburg Gate was kind of a neutral space. The main place for Americans was Checkpoint Charlie, and for those of us who would travel more often, Friedrichstrasse, which was very mm -hmm. complicated, a part west, part east. So w we did see how the media moved to Brandenburg Gate, and there was nothing to watch for a while until the media kind of created something there. Um, and the third thing that what's great is you. I guess it's the question is when does shorthand become myth? Because for those of us who talk about Berlin, it gets tedious to talk about solidarity in Poland and then the Hungary Austria border opening and the East Germans going to embassies and then, as you mentioned, the Leipzig protests. And so those of us who talk about Berlin find at some point that bore students. So we, we fall into this let's talk about the fall of the Berlin Wall um, and no longer qualify it. And, and we think of ourselves, okay, that's a shorthand, but when does shorthand become myth? Mm -hmm. oh, excellent question, thank you. So about the first one, um, absolutely, there was no talk about unification. It would have been dangerous to discuss it at that point uh, because of the international political situation. There was much carefulness when it comes to uh, that aspect. And one thing that I also realized by looking at the anniversary is that you know, the first anniversary happened after the unification. And there was barely any anniversary coverage of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Because why? Because Germany was busy with the reunification. They didn't have time to commemorate a year an event a year beforehand. And also because it happened on November 9, which is also the anniversary of Kristallnacht, major event from the Holocaust. 
So that was the first piece of news on TV news, Kristallnacht commemoration, and then talking about elements of the reunification. But that changed by um, the next anniversary, and certainly by the 5th, 10th, and 20th, Kristallnacht got moved back. Uh, and um, this story of the fall of the Berlin was strongly connected with the unification became the central uh, central element of the story. So it's interesting how it, it got connected to the unification, reunification uh, over time. And with the, with the last element, um, that's something I keep thinking about since I'm teaching continuously. So it, it is a key question of how do we tell these stories. And I believe in an ideal world. Obviously, we want to tell all the contradictions and, and, and complexities. But then there is a larger question. I think the most provocative claim of the book is the power of banality in some ways. That um, as tricky it is how um, it is commemorated currently, it might be the only way how the event actually survives. So there is a radical question to ask, do we want this event to be remembered by our students and next generations and by your kids afterwards? Or do we want to tell um, each and every element of the story which people may or may not pay attention to. And, and I think that's something that is a question um, in connection with many other events as well. Yeah. Sure. I think there was another one here. You will? Yeah. You will? Oh. Oh. Okay. I'm coming up. <laughs> okay. well, you somehow kind of answered it. Uh, I'm interested about the methodization of the, of the events. Yeah. So do you think that like commemorating the, the fall of the Berlin Wall through those uh, museums and those exhibitions, do you think it turns into some kind of entertainment? Because it seems to me that it's, it, it turns into some kind of entertainment while the wall itself has a very painful memory. People died there. So I'm just curious if those people making, making those exhibitions are aware of the, the history, or do they talk about the, the history of the wall, or is it just merit, merit in, in, entertainment? Yeah, I mean, th those who organize this obviously know what was going on on the ground, and they try to balance it. And there are multiple exhibitions at the anniversaries that also address the pain of the event. But they are keenly aware of the fact that there are also many internationals arriving in Berlin. It's, it's really a global city. So um, I don't think it's simply entertainment, what is going on here. What I think is going on here is actually condensation and trying to find some kind of core element of this, m of this event that can travel across time, space, and media. And that requires the removal of some of the facts, the details, uh, which is a controversial process. But I don't think it's simply, um, simply entertainment. Um, <coughs> so another example to think about it, um, if you consider how we narrate the Holocaust, uh, there is a central symbol of Auschwitz. Um, we don't necessarily mention all the camps involved, right? I mean, researchers. So, Auschwitz doesn't represent everything that was going on during the Holocaust, but it comes to stand for it. And that is the interesting question here, too, whether this simplified version will come to stand for the event in some way or, or not. Yeah. Well, it's linking to this um, issue. Is that on? OK. Um, the, there's the power of the image. So there's something that's very powerful of the, uh, the visual, and the visual not only of the wall, but people on the wall. So it's like this popular movement. I think that this is very seductive for audiences, and especially for, for Western audiences, rather than like apparatchiks, you know, shaking hands. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that the power of, and I, don't, I wanted to know if you talk about this a little bit more in the book, um, the power of the image and what the image captures with the material object and the people then comes to symbolize the entire transition to post-communism um, at the detriment of the actual long-standing and very hard work between you know, the opposition and uh, governments. Like the round table is not in Poland, it's not a photogenic event, right? It's boring, it's plain, <laughs> and it's also nothing happens quite after, and whatever happens is not, again, aesthetically powerful. So I guess there's two questions. One is about the power of aesthetics, mm -hmm. um, and also the power of events that can be captured in a single moment, whereas the Polish story is 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that then, you know, is May, June, uh, and that summer. Uh, and I know that's for Poles, and since I teach about Poland, it's always very frustrating when people <laughs> talk about the fall of the wall. Well, you know what? I mean, it happens 
several months before in Poland, the beginning of the end, and years before. So I wonder if you can talk about this also, how other stories and the actual process is silenced by the power of these iconic moments. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Thanks. I mean, I keep thinking of, of it as a Hungarian too, of you know, all, all, all the things that were going on beforehand, and there is this moment that is uh, remembered. And um, I think there is there there is one danger of it that this is how we imagine successful social movements, that you know, beat Twitter now and a Twitter revolution, that it would happen in a second. It comes out of nowhere. It doesn't uh, take boring meetings and endless hours at night and a lot of coffees until the early morning. And so, on. but it will be this moment when suddenly people get there, and and um, and I think what is important to realize here, which I think that press conference image really captures, is is really the power of lengthy meetings, um, long work, uh, and sometimes accidents, mistakes in life. We can all list those in our own lives as well, uh, but in our narration, we try to give the impression that we make conscious decisions throughout our lives and this is, you know, these are the key moments of our lives and, and so on. And, and this story shows that no, in real life, uh, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process and a very often boring process. Um, so the central icon in that sense, I think, has some dangers that it, it, it misleads us in terms of what is a powerful social movement and how social movements are actually constructed. But at the same time, it also provides us with a hopeful narrative. And um, so I think that's the tricky balance there of if at least we have, <laughs> at least we have a hopeful narrative. So I end the book with the, with the sentence that when international military courts have failed and currencies have failed and international alliances are in trouble like the European Union, then stories may well be all we have left to bring hope and unity. And it's a very melancholic sentence. I, you know, I'm, I'm aware of that, but that's what I'm interested in, that in some sense a story could help us uh, bring hope or bring a message. Yeah, here. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess this is on. Uh, thank you so much for this really wonderful talk. I, I think my question in some ways is, is piggybacking off the previous one. Uh, I'm sure echoing others as well, which is just, and maybe it's a little too existential, but sort of how do you fight myth then? Uh, how do you create, I mean, I'm, I'm also trying to figure out if counter narratives have, have any power, um, and if, if the counter narrative has to be created really quickly to fight the, the myth, it just, I mean, you know, I just know from my own work and from my own experiences, just, you know, former East Germans feeling really ambivalent in some ways about the fall of the Berlin Wall for a variety of reasons. Like, they're sort of left out because oftentimes the myth is, like, everyone was so excited to unify, right? Like, East and West Germans were so excited about it. It was just one big celebration and party after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I mean, so I'm thinking about, like, hmm, it, the ways in which, again, sort of every, it, there's so much left out, mm -hmm. I think, in this mythology, in this sort of simplification. I also think about different ethnic minorities in Germany, sort of Turkish German, Jewish Germans, Afro Germans, who also have a different narrative of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and also sort of remember feeling excluded. So I'm just trying to figure out how do how do we fight this myth in some way, or how do you how do you sort of like create powerful counter narratives? Uh, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. I keep thinking a lot about th these days too. Obviously. Uh, I think one central message of, of this research is, and it will not be a, you know, a message that is easy to listen to, that it's very hard to fight myths with facts. Uh, it, this is what was going on on that night. There was a factual and objective coverage uh, with all its um, you know, biases and so on, but there was still, um, you know, it captured the confusion, it captured the transition and so on, and it wasn't capturing at the same time for the audience itself. So I think the only way um, is to, to find a, fight a myth is with, with another one. You know, uh, which, and I would like to emphasize that how I'm, how I'm using mythologies here is not in the sense that this is fundamentally untrue. So there are two meanings of mythologies. One is when we claim that nothing is true and, and this is just fabricated. The other way of thinking mythology is that it has some core element that is true, but it is a powerful story that resonates. Uh, major Greek mythologies are, you know, that we carry with us. There are stories we carry with us and so on. So I think that's, that's the way to, to, to fight myths, to, to create a counter story that has equal power. Um, 
and it, it will not deconstruct the myth if you say what these were the actual you know set of facts and I completely agree with what what it leaves out right? it leaves out quite a lot uh, and uh, when it comes to the anniversary coverage and the it leaves actually currently everything out except for the fall of the Berlin Wall as the major national event of Germany, which is, um, you know, a controversial in many respects, including that erasure of, of uh, Kristallnacht uh, in that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Professor. This talk was awesome. Um, I was wondering if you, you mentioned really quickly uh, the first East German border gate guard's reaction when he opened it up. And I was wondering if in your research you had any chance to, maybe it's in the book, maybe it's just not something you looked at as much, like interview, I'm particularly interested in how these East German, both gate, gate guards and maybe party officials in town in Berlin or in similar towns, what their reaction, how they like, in their memory now, how they see the event. I, I, did you do any of that kind of work? Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's great. Yes, yeah, so what is interesting about ha what they did on, on that night, so obviously this is not the age of cell phones and, and so on, so there was a, a, a communicational problem in reaching the leadership on that night because <coughs> they were in a meeting. Uh, so it was very hard, to, uh, they, they were late in catching up with the story. Why were they in a meeting? Because there was a major political transition. They had other things to discuss. They thought they just announced the travel regulation in fact, uh, Gunther Schabowski was so calm after this press conference and interview that he went back home and he didn't think you know, much would happen on, uh, on that night. So um, that was their immediate reaction, um, discussing at the meeting other issues. And then over time as they got reached, uh, there was major confusion in terms of how to react to what's going on um, on the border. And there were a lot of accidental elements in how it unfolded at the end, but the border crossing point opening, it, it was an individual decision. Now, this border guard, for instance, who opened it up, uh, there's, a, there's a great interview with him, and he had a very hard time to, to cheer um, to the German soccer game for years after, games for years afterwards, because he, he couldn't celebrate the reunification, even in the form of, of, form of football. So for, a, for an East European like me, um, there is a, there is a lot of there are a lot of questions about what are the counter me memories of of this event um, and how are they embodied in the city of Berlin? Many of you know one of the heartbreaking elements is that there is a great tendency to deconstruct the buildings that were in connection with these German past, like the Palace der Republik, uh, most importantly, which means like not having even the physical reminders of. Uh, the, the past. Uh, it's a heartbreak for those who lived through the time and have personal memories of these spaces, but it also raises again the question of how are we going to tell the story to future generations if there is barely anything left of it. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's a really fascinating story. And I actually have two questions, maybe one question, one comment. So the question is about the, mm, all these paintings, all the graffiti that are, you know, created on the wall and recreated. So what kind of story do they tell and how their narratives actually fit or don't fit the narrative, that this master narrative that you presented? And the other question comment, I think it was Stefan Heim who came out with a very strong critique of that whole movement. And yeah. he was not exactly a figure of establishment. He was, of course, a very controversial person. But I think he made a very powerful speech telling these the Germans that you don't know what you are getting. And he spent many years in the United States. And he said, you, you will be basically, you will lose your identity, if I remember correctly. So I'm wondering if there were any other public figures, not officials, but kind of semi-independent East German intellectuals who would be critical of that whole movement. And what happened to their? the stories. Yeah, I mean, oh, there was a lot of local criticism, and there is still actually there is a growing criticism, obviously, of, of this narration. As the power of the commemoration of the fall of the Berlin Wall grows, um, so grows the opposition uh, among intellectuals. Just because it takes over everything, even if you look at front pages, the, the commemoration of the fall of the Berlin Wall is just completely <laughs> there with the central symbols, editing out um, everything that is left. In terms of the graffitis, so one interesting element about the graffiti is that it's, it's really a, a 1980s phenomenon. So the, the Berlin Wall went through four distinct designs, and 
and that white surface uh, with the graphite this is a relatively late uh, moment in time. And then what we see now is a continuous revising of the surfaces. So what I find interesting about the graphite is that the many of the ones that we look at now are, were created well after 1989, but still for those who take the pictures in Berlin in front of these segments, it, it seems like they are taking the image of, of the original Berlin. Most, to, to me, that's the, the, the most exciting element. The other is how, it, how the graphite is condensed some of the meanings of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that happens not only on, on, on the Berlin Wall itself, but uh, for instance, uh, the Israeli uh, separation wall. There are graffitis that will directly recall the fall of the Berlin Wall. Like I found one which said, all walls come down eventually. You know, so there is this it's imagination. If you have a wall, that, that it's, then its fall is actually embedded. It would happen uh, over time. So that's, that's one aspect how I research the graffitis. Graffitis on contemporary separation walls recalling the fall of the Berlin Wall itself. Thank you so much. Thank you.